So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I hope uh, just have enough people to start the session. And uh, this is a session of interesting cases. Uh, there are a lot of cases which are lined up, and the most challenging part of the cases, other than the case itself, is the time which you have is just three minutes, right? So I would urge all of you to refrain from talking beyond three minutes so that we can have a healthy discussion. And I would also suggest that uh, avoid avoid literature search so that you will have the real unbiased inputs from the panel members. Okay? So these are two important requisites. Be on time and avoid having literature searches in your presentation. I know in three minutes you will not be able to do that. Avoid the third effect. So I would call on the panel members or vice council as they like to be addressed as. Uh, Dr. Vas is already here. Dr. Deshpande is here. And uh, Tapas is there. And uh, Dr. Talwar? Dr. Talwar? Having lunch, okay. So uh, Dr. Mahesh Shanmukam would be joining in place of uh, Dr. Shubha Shukrasar. So nevertheless, we'll get started because time is important. And uh, we'll have the first case. Which, uh, would be present, which would be presented by Dr. Rahul, and he would be presenting on bilateral theory on the optic disc, bake or bite. Shall we put to go? I think it's uploading the wrong slide. And there is uh, one another chain. Uh, is Dr. Renu here? Dr. Renu? Yes. So what we do can we start the next case after Vishal presents. So, and uh, Dr. Akash should be taking your place. So you will be presenting next after Dr. Okay. Have you loaded your presentation? Right. Thank you. Okay. Good, Good afternoon. <coughs> my title for my talk is Bilateral Cherry on the Optic Disc, whether to bake or bite. I have no financial disclosures. It's a small disclosure related to a non-FD approval use of bevacizumab and ozodex in this presentation. A 34-year-old gentleman complained of diminution of vision in the both the eyes since one week in a recent consultation elsewhere or diagnosed to have some kind of lesion of the optic disc and was referred to me for second opinion. This is how the white field fundus photography shows a kind of orange elevated red vascular lesions in the juxtapapillary area, uh, larger in size in the right eye as compared to small in the left eye with some kind of exudation seen in and around the lesion with presence of subretinal fluid. At a closer look, you could see the lesion had a kind of surface vascularity and looked kind of active with leakage seen in and around the lesion. The OCT and OCTA, which was done, showed that the lesion had a kind of uh, exopatic variant with, uh, arising from the inner retinal layers with posterior back shadowing. In the macular area, there was interretinal fluid and some amount of uh, uh, subretinal fluid. The OCTA in the uh, retinal parapapillary slab showed uh, presence of increased vascularity as well as flow signals, suggesting that tumor had kind of uh, activity within that. Same similar features were noted in the left eye again, where you could see the lesion had an interretinal component as well as uh, subretinal and interretinal fluid. Flores in angiography from early to late phase again showed the lesion kind of increasing in intensity as well as the size with late leakage seen at 8 minutes. A systemic workup was uh, undertaken where on ultrasound abdomen showed presence of bilateral simple renal cortical cyst as well as a kind of uh, very heterogeneous left renal mass which was a uh, patient was referred to nephrologist to rule out any kind of renal cell carcinoma or periocarcytoma. Genetic counseling was undertaken and the genetic testing for VHO gene mutation was performed which was positive and showed dominant missense mutation in exon 1 of VHL gene, thereby confirming a diagnosis of uh, both eyes juxtapapillary retinal capillary hemangioblastoma with underlying VHL disease. As due to unavailability of uh, photodynamic treatment uh, at present, uh, the only option what we had to use a uh, transpupillary thermotherapy. However, the lesion was very close to the optic disc and to prevent in and collateral damage, uh, what I thought was to use ICG guided transpupillary thermotherapy with intravitreal bevacizumab. And these are my specifications for the laser what I used. At two months follow up, the visual acuity in the right eye improved from 2080 to 2060 and left eye kind of 2025 with resolution of uh, subretinal fluid as well as interretinal fluid in both the eyes. Uh, Octa again showed decrease in the tumor blood flow signals as compared to the previous visit and due to uh, uh, amount of uh, leakage which was still present, a repeat session of transpupillary thermotherapy as well as intravital uh, long acting ozodex injection was contemplated. And this was post treatment again after two months you could see tumor showed kind of partial response with presence of some amount of pre-retinal fibrosis in and around the tumor with the complete resolution of fluid in the macular area. 
to conclude i would say juxta capillary retinal capillary hemangioblastoma are kind of challenging to treat however to make sure that uh, as compared to peripheral tumors uh, close to 50 to 70 percent of patients have underlying vhl disease and there are no established protocols or guidelines to treat and itg guided tt can be a cost effective and viable alternative to photodynamic treatment thank you thanks uh, vishal actually uh, the question to you was uh, that was a well uh, handled case so uh, what the question is the challenge of the tumor being in the peripapillary location does exist in terms of it now this when the absence of photodynamic therapy and what are the improvisations in the treatment which you would consider the managing of these cases First of all, congratulations on a, a very interesting case. I, I, I've seen, I have several patients with uh, von Hippo Lindau, and most of them have peripheral man, mangioblastoma. It's an interesting case because it's bilateral optic nerve or peripapillary location. Um, and so, you know, generally for the peripheral lesions, we like PDT, as you were alluding to, Avinash, uh, although we've treated some with anti VEGF with, quite frankly, not great results. Uh, I use combination on many of them, anti VEGF and uh, uh, and, uh, and and PDT, uh, and so I understand the PDT wasn't available, and obviously we have a global um, shortage of vertiporphyrin right now. Uh, so um, so before we had vertiporphyrin, we had some of these polypoidal cases in the, the past. We used we used to do this ICG enhanced sort of um, inclusive therapy. The only difference that that I used to do when I used to do that treatment was that I would continue the ICGA infusion while I was applying the spot. So oh. you did the infusion and then you stopped. And just because it seemed like the ICG would wash out wash relatively out. fast. Uh, and so, but they did, and again, clearly you had some response. That might be the one difference. I think it's reasonable. The only other thing I might have considered, even though, again, as I said, I have not been that impressed with anti vegf therapy, I might have added it here just because it would have just a, such a difficult to treat lesion and, uh, and location without having PDT as well. So I might have done combination, but you actually were able to at least get some control for this patient. Now there is a dye here, Dr. Pallu. So there, there are two more variations in this. Uh, one is the, the wavelength of the light which, and then the dye which is there. And so is there any uh, thought process which could be applied, especially when you have the affinity of increased affinity of ICG uh, in, in this subset of patients towards the proteins, would that help in any way? I, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I completely follow the question. So, in a sense, the ICD doesn't refuse to leak because of the increased protein adherence and, right. and the location which is there is dominantly employed. Now, we have a tumor which is there and coming from the peripapillary area and the juxtapapillary area. Would that influence in any way an outcome? of uh, when you guide it with the TTT? Well, uh, that, that's why I was saying, I, I think, you know, the way I've done this before, I haven't, I have to confess, I haven't done this in, since vertiporphyrin <coughs> became available, this is sort of pre vertiporphyrin days, is that because you get pretty rapid clearance, and you're right, you don't have, really want to maximize your photothrombotic effect. So I would, uh, you know, the idea is you have this big coil loop or a bunch of vessels there, so if you have active infusion, you'll have a fair amount of ICPA concentration, and then you light it up with uh, with a long wavelength. So this the diode laser, something like that, is what that for, for that. Yeah. That's that's how I used to do it. I don't know if I I feel like I haven't. Maybe somebody can do a better no. job of answering up that question. I feel like I haven't answered it properly. To a certain extent, yes, Dr. Whether we can have coagulation of specific vessel. Because when you are doing any destructive procedure, since it was on the nasal side, it is better. It's not destroying <laughs> many of the neuronal cells. But if you destroy them, it is going to cause loss of thumb vision will be central. So can we have a focal coagulation of particular leaking vessels? So you are alluding to applying the directly. directly. So, so for the peripheral capillary mangiomas, we have the feeder vessel and the draining venule that we can do. But for juxta papillary, we don't have the exactly. feeder vessels. But she's talking about the posterior one. Okay. Thermal laser to the posterior lesions, right? And so that that uh, that was the other question which uh, was I was supposed to ask in terms of if not for TTT, for 
yellow wavelength is something which one would think of in uh, trying out yeah. in this. Yeah, I think that should be the one of the option if available. I think yellow laser should be have a much major, uh, greater uptake as compared to long duration diode laser. So, but I think the availability of the laser again is the issue. Avinash. That I, I would be a little bit worried about doing that without having good um, visualization ability to treat the artery. Because I'd want to obviously close the artery first before then blasting the lesion because you might have a significant hemorrhage that might be challenging to manage. Right. Avinash, do you believe so, that the safety was higher, would be higher with a TTT with ICG versus a thermal laser? Because actually, effectively, you're using the TTT as a thermal laser when you use ICG with it. It's not, it's, it's nowhere related to what PDT is. PDT is activation of the dye. Here there's no activation of the dye. Here the dye is actually concentrating the heat for you. So if it's concentrating the heat, it's actually a thermal laser. It's not a, a photochemical laser. And if you use IC, uh, if you use a diode laser, you're actually, it's like you may or may not see the lesion, uh, the, the laser as well, the spot. But it's a, it is as intense. So you could as well use an argon laser. It makes no difference. I mean, I don't... So, yeah, the only issue with argon, the spot size is very small. So it's yeah, that, other than that, it, so you do multiple spots. That's, but you are more accurate in how far away you can stay from the disc. With one spot, that's much more difficult. With multiple small spots, you can very clearly outline that you want to stay only this much. Leave this margin from the disc, which is what we try to do even with... PDT, we used to try to leave 400 micron. So even if you can leave 300 micron, 400 micron away and laser the rest, you'll be able to do it more accurately with an, with an argon laser or what, a frequency double laser, YAG laser, than you would be able to do with one large spot of a TTT. Okay. So you can increase the spot size, right? Even with the yellow laser and the green laser. Yeah, and you on the lens, then it doubles. It doubles, it becomes thousand. But the the laser light what we use itself has the green wavelength. I think we are not able to see what we are where the focus or the what the laser is showing the reaction on. As compared to TTT, when we do, we see the reaction on the tumor itself. On the green light, you will not be able to see what is happening on the surface of the tumor or what the reaction is happening. What I'm thinking is probably you will be able to see because red would absorb the green, isn't it? So you will be able to see the changes happening there unless and until the power is very low. Aiming beam intensity. The aiming beam intensity is not correlated with the uh, laser intensity. So if you're using an argon laser, decrease your aiming beam intensity to the minimum so that you can see where you're doing. And then when you do it, you will know what intensity you need. You, you, you can uh, do the same with an argon laser. I mean, the reason I'm pointing this out is the role of ICG in this situation is not of a photochemical laser. It is a that's, 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 so let's not confuse the two. Yeah, Both are similar lasers. This is only to prevent the collateral damage, so that the laser what we are doing is localized and focused on that. But you, you will that will be better with the argon laser because the diode when you're using part of that dye is roaming around within all the uh, the entire retinal architecture. So actually, part of that is absorbing the heat. So it's much better that if you use an argon laser, you know you only that area where the RP is getting heated up is getting it. But where you're using a diode with ICG, the ICG has gone into the retinal architecture. It will also absorb the heat. You have less clear-cut margin than you would with an argon I laser. I think the point we're taking, uh, I, one last point from you actually, Vishal. Like what, would be, what would be your suggestion for the audience where you would play like, the indications of the bracket therapy in patients who present with similar type of lesion. So I think the role of bracket therapy holds only in cases where the height of the lesion is more than four millimeters, particularly in the peripheral location. But juxta papillary, I don't advise or I don't think so. Your uh, black bracket therapy will be a better choice. I think for peripheral locations only, right. not for. So uh, I think thanks. Sir. Thank you. And Thank we you. got a lot of important points in that presentation. We yeah. saw an interesting case of a peripapillary location. Uh, where the challenges would be retained in respect to uh, what type of laser one would like to adopt and the, the poor efficacy of anti vengers in these type of lesions were also highlighted and the discussion went on whether to use which wavelength of laser 
whether it's going to be a photo uh, PDT or it's going to be photothermal laser. And then you also heard the indication of brachytherapy in these patients, if it has to be more than so, and if it's a pet from So we'll move on to the second case. And uh, there's a change where Dr. Renu would be presenting on unusual challenge in a child with retinopathy of prematurity. to all. Thank VRSA for this opportunity. So our patient was a female baby, one of twins, delivered by normal vaginal delivery, no uh, documented use of forceps or suction, at 25 weeks of gestational age with a birth weight of 7-12 grams. Uh, the uh, first two uh, months of uh, the neonatal period were of uh, Turbulent course for the baby, poor respiratory efforts, baby was intubated, baby was treated for electrolyte abnormalities, hyperglycemia, suspected sepsis, anemia, jaundice and also given fresh frozen plasma twice. He presented for ROP screening at 4 weeks and at that time the weight was 730 grams. On screening the angio segment was alright uh, on dilated fundus examination. On the right eye, uh, we could trace the vessels uh, in the, within the zone 1 with few loops were there, but not much of dilatation or tortuosity. In the left eye, we found that there are multiple tears just outside uh, in the nasal side within the zone 1 and the temporal side outside the uh, zone 1 within the avascular area. And the vessels were more uh, dilated and bit tortuous compared to the other eye. So, And uh, no evidence of other ocular trauma or uh, birth related injury like retinal hemorrhages or vitreous hemorrhage was there. No other history of torch infections, no skeletal or facial dysmorphic features or syndromic associations, no evidence of battered baby syndrome. And at that time, uh, like we were, this was a new situation for us, and uh, there was uh, evolving aggressive ROP along with tears. So we made a decision to inject anti up first. And uh, then we proceeded within a day to uh, barrage the affected, uh, the attached part to the posterior to the, uh, just posterior to the brakes. Anterior to the brakes, uh, already SRF was there and so we could not laser it. So, uh, and uh, the child was systemically not fit for a general anesthesia procedure. So, we went on for weekly follow-ups of this baby and uh, one month post laser also, the posterior laser mass are good and holding the retina, but the uh, edges are already scrolled. So uh, at around three months of the child stage, the child uh, developed the total detachment. The lens had also subluxed posteriorly and the retina was stiff. Once the child was systemically stable, she was taken up for a 25 gauge pars plane of vitrectomy and lensectomy. But the intraoperative attempt to reattach the retina was unsuccessful. Post-operately, the media remained hazy with dispersed vitreous hemorrhage. The other eye had a better outcome. It evolved on to an AROP and we treated with Vyarsismac followed by uh, uh, lasers. Right. And okay. yes. yeah. right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ranjan. And that's a very interesting case. Uh, Sampas, you know you have lost experience in the management of ROP and have also heard you speaking that in, in avascular retina, the subretinal Space is not firm. Okay? So, developmentally, so there is a change which happens. So, the detachment literally does not happen in the avascular retina. So, now in this particular child, so what caused a giant retinal tear in this patient? Because a 25 week child of gestational age, what precipitated a giant retinal tear? Very, very uh, rare to see such an incident in, in a case of acute ROP. Uh, usually, this the retinal breaks happen in cicatricial or involutional ROP because the vitreous and retina attachment are never normal in a prematurely born child. So they are abnormal, and uh, especially if they have previously regressed ROP with cicatricial change, they can pull and cause break. In an acute uh, in a ROP like this or early ROP like this is very rare. I feel uh, the probable reason would be uh, number one uh, the there would be some vitreoretinal changes at the vascular avascular junction and vitreous condensation that would have caused localized traction would have caused uh, 
uh, the tear to happen at the vascular avascular junction with rolling of the margin there probably there is a vitreous force which is working from the disc on the surface of the retina at the vascular avascular junction so this is what i could uh, think of whatever is happening is happening uniformly at 360 degree right there's yeah. 360 degree red uh, nearly 270 degrees so superior degree. was uh, attached for some time before right. it uh, i uh, the lens was subluxated so i don't know whether the child had some sort of vitreo retinopathy or something that caused weakness of the jonule and also have contributed to this right. abnormal uh, vitreo retinal adhesion. Actually, during the first visit, the, at one month of age, the child's lens was in normal position. As the retinal detachment progresses, so we thought it would somehow associated with the progress of the detachment. The vitreous contracting and pulling the lens back probably. Because the other eye, the uh, lens was intact and in normal position. So, so I just have one more question to you uh, because you raised this topic about you know the changes which happens at the junction of the avascular and vascular retina, vitreo retinal abnormal addition. So having uh, seen that, and you also have seen management. In hindsight, would you have done anything different, provided the child would have got fitness and at the 25th week? You know, one of the biggest handicap in this was the child did not get. Now, if the child had to present at 25th week in your clinic, right, and everything else was taken care, would you have done anything different? Yeah, <clears throat> so, I don't know that this is the first uh, of its kind, uh, first report that uh, that is being presented. So, what I would have done uh, in the hindsight, I thought if you know, we would have got uh, GA fitness, I would have uh, gone for vitrectomy and put an oil and kept the patient parents prepared for a re-intervention later on. I was thinking that the sublux lens probably is not something to hear at all because you see 20 cases of retinal detachment, they don't necessarily produce sublux lens. So there is a relationship etiologically between the lens subluxation and the tear. It's more likely that there is an injury to the left eye, which is unidentified after all in the ICU, so many things happen which we go, which go unnoticed, including even the straps they put around the head to put the tube, oxygen tube, anything, some trauma has occurred to the left eye, and there is a horizontal uh, elongation of the eye because of the compression, and that produced traction along the border of avascular vascular retina because the vitreous is anomalous, and there's already some early ROP developing, and hence it tore at that point. I would relate it to an injury, which is the source of it, which we cannot always understand. Barring that, management-wise, yes, unless you have GA, you really can't do anything. What you have done, you, you tried your best to barrage it, but obviously that was not enough to salvage the eye. Before it causes a retinal tear, before it causes a retinal tear, you should see fibrovascular proliferation. You see nothing there. You see only anomalous vitreous probably, and you see the junction of avascular and vascular retina. For fever to cause retinal tears, it would take uh, fibrovascular tissue to pull it. I would relate it to injury, but as I said, it is a, a hypothesis which I cannot prove. Uh, we had examined the parents of the child also. They did not have any vascular uh, problems. Right, I think uh, that's a very interesting case, and the point which came up was are anomalous vitreoretinal additions at the mid periphery between the vascular and avascular, uh, a possible hypothesis of uh, a trauma which went unnoticed. And for all given circumstances, you did what was best to be done to this patient. But just one point, actually, the question to you is you have done a literature search as well, and there have been a couple of reports of giant retinal tear happening in patients with acute ROP. So, what is your take on that? How do yeah. you reflect? on those reports? Yeah, uh, most of the reports are in uh, treated cases with, uh, during the era, era of cryo, there are many cases. After uh, one report of the end retinal tear, in a post laser case is there, sir. I could not find one without intervention. Like that, spontaneous, I couldn't find that, that is similar to what Tapas has attested that you find the end retinal tear happening in patient in secret resale. Surgery, they could not, I guess. The retina re attempt, retina. We attempted surgery, but by then it was too late. It was already... Maybe it, it, it 
extensive pvr would have happened by then it was a totally crumbled retina it couldn't be uh, reopened sir right thank you so much dr ranjan so uh, we thank move you, on to the next case the next case is from uh, it's going to be presented dr arpit sharma dr sharma is going to present a case of central retinal artery occlusion in ada to de to deficiency Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Arpit Sharma, and I'll be talking about an interesting case I saw recently. Uh, but before we begin, uh, what is Occam's razor? So, if there are two hypotheses, uh, the simpler hypothesis is always the true. But is it possible that can a single hypothesis explain a, a child having myasthenia gravis, Guillain-Barré syndrome, polyarthritis nodosa, hypertension, and a CRAO? It's a story of an 11-year-old girl who presented to us with the intermittent divergence squint, basic type. With six six vision in both eyes, she had uh, when she was two year old, she had a diagnosis of a Guillain-Barré syndrome because of the acute flaccid paralysis, which was rapidly uh, progressive. She was treated with steroids, and uh, even though uh, lumbar puncture was normal, uh, when she was four year old, she had difficulty in getting up from the sitting position. Uh, the serological markers for the uh, myasthenia gravis, diastole, conjunctival septa, and musk were negative, and she was treated with pyridostigmine, and she had a very good response to it. Three months after, when she presented to us, she uh, went to a pediatrician with a history of fever, weight loss, and pain abdomen. And incidentally, BP was found to be high. And there was a rash on the thigh, which turned out to be septal paniculitis with medium vessel vasculitis uh, consisting of granulocytes. And incidentally, brother also had a very high BP. So ADA2 deficiency was suspected along with the polyarthritis nodosa being diagnosed in this child. And she was started on azathioprine and steroids. She came to us uh, after that. There was no new uh, ocular complaints, but incidentally, there was fundus finding that uh, there was blurring of the uh, disc margin in the left eye with the hard exudate. It was thought to be a neuroretinitis. So she was already on treatment for uh, polyarthritis nodosa. So we started the patient on azith uh, azithromycin and then we asked for the neuroretinitis blood worker. Just three days later, she comes back with the ciliar retinal artery sparing CRAO. Fortunately, by that time, we also had the diagnosis of the ADA2 deficiency. She was started on I, uh, IV methylprednisolone and uh, also the adalimumab. And this is the last follow-up, consistent with the CRAO old findings. So what is ADA2 deficiency? It's actually uh, 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 the ADA2 enzyme causes uh, increase in the adenosine levels, which either increases the naive B cells causing abnormal humoral response, or it increases the M1 level causing the abnormal cell-mediated immunity. And there are 13 cases till now reported with this uh, 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 syndrome where two were CRAOs. And to be, uh, so in simple words, it's, there is a simple hypothesis which is explaining it, that is ADA2 deficiency. And if you, you should suspect it when there is a child with multiple autoimmune disorders, end of family history, and a pediatric uh, polyarthritis nodosa. That is the strongest association. And it has a major therapeutic significance because you need to treat it with the tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors only. It doesn't respond to Ezra. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you so much. And and it would have been a very challenging to diagnose that, right? It's yes. life saving. And goes to go to on to say that in most of the patients who present with vasculitis, especially the ones in the pediatric age group, they have to be flagged for a possible systemic return. Right, sir. And uh, I think I think that was something good. Uh, was anything different from your side? I've I've never seen a case of this. So good good uh, pick up um, and. Uh, Congrats on management. Okay. Right. So the learning happens is most of the people would be thinking, I don't see this case has not happened because, and you would see this in one of the differential diagnosis in your text somewhere at the bottom. And only these cases would highlight that you would reprioritize this so that you will remember at least these can be a part of a differential when you encounter a patient with, and especially a pediatric patient with a central lateral artery occlusion. Nevertheless, most of the central lateral artery occlusion are systemic associated. Dr. Talwar, last word. Doesn't work only then cause think of another alternative pathology. I was just in this. 30 seconds uh, going through the net, and already they say, when you have a combination of myasthenia gravis with Guillain Barre, look for autoimmune disorders. Yes. So already that's there. This is already in the literature. So that should have woken up 
uh, at that time itself that now we have to see what else and polyarthritis nodosa then CRO is the next thing you you need to look at so it's a great job and you, the, the, the most important thing is you manage to find the exact treatment but all based because of that one fellow who gave us oxam's razor and, and another learning is uh, they don't usually respond to steroid that well and it has to be more distal level of treatment So I'll be presenting the case as titled. So in our country, the commonest cause of methyl alcohol poisoning is by consumption of illicit liquor. And this, in this year itself, there have been two large episodes in states where the liquor is prohibited. And on the left is uh, the prominent ones which have happened in our country over the years. So 24 years, healthy male resident of Bihar, a farmer by profession, consumed illicit liquor on the 10th of March. And his four drinkers, five of them died uh, by consuming the same liquor. He was okay for two days, and after which he developed sudden bilateral loss of vision on the 12th of March. He came to us on the 17th. So on examination, systemically he was okay, but his vision was PLPR accurate both eyes. Both the pupils were mid-dilated, reacting very sluggishly. And only, the only clinical findings were optic nerve heads were mildly hyperemic, a little edematous, and there was edema along the retinal arcades as well, and maybe fine ILM folds. The rest was fine, including the intraocular pressure. The edema of the optic nerve head was confirmed by the OCT RNFL, which was thickened. The OCT also showed thickening along the retinal arcades, and the macula OCT was just fine. This was the right eye. The left eye looked similar. The GCC also showed some uh, widening of the least area of GCC. And at this stage, we diagnosed him as methyl alcohol optic neuropathy and referred him to a physician and advised what I thought was the standard of care, three IVMPs, which he went on to take on the 17th to 19th of March. Two days after this, I called him up and he said, my goodness, I'm feeling much better, bilkul clear dikh raha hai. And I told him to start oral steroids and come and follow up after a week. However, he came back earlier, two days later, saying that his vision had again dropped, and this time it was almost down to counting finger, two meters and N36. So I said, let me give him two more IV MPs, as the neurologists like to give five doses, and I had given only three, which he took, and he said there was no improvement at all. Now, this is where I said, okay, continue our oral steroids, and I ran back to do some literature search, because this was a hale and hearty 24-year-old boy who had suddenly become bilaterally blind. So on literature search, I found that erythropoietin, intravenous, subcutaneous, etc., had been used for such patients. I referred him to a neurologist friend who, in consultation with a nephrologist, they are the ones who use it frequently, went on to give him the erythropoietin, as well as did an MRI brain and orbits, which showed only a proximal optic nerves. Fortunately, the brain was okay, which is also involved in these kind of cases. So he was lost for 10 days, and then suddenly he arrived, and he said, hey, I felt better two or three days after the erythropoietin, but this time I didn't come early because I wasn't sure whether the effect would last like last time. So now his vision was 6, 9, N8, and his features were all becoming better. His disc edema was decreasing, as confirmed by this comparative OCT RNFL, right eye, left eye. Now I could do his feels. The feels showed the center was somewhat little okay, but the rest was quite affected. This is the right eye. The left eye was a little better. And he was given tapering oral steroids, antioxidants, folate, which are the standard of care for such patients, vitamin B1, B6, B12. And it, since he's gone back to Bihar, not come back, he says he's okay. He talks to me on the phone, but doesn't come back. Of course, there are several lacunae in my investigations and documentation, largely because the patient was ill affording. And I really hadn't seen these cases except many, many years ago. So I, I suppose I'd I better think, stop. Yeah. yeah. My discussion is that did the EPO really cause improvement in this patient or was it a coincidence? And do you think we should start using erythropoietin as a first line in severe cases along with the steroids so that we give them the best that we have? Yeah. Just one minute. Did you tell him to stop drinking? Uh, <laughs> you know, anyway, I missed that out. <laughs> Dr. Deshpande, so any, anything in, in your experience? Uh, we know steroids is a standard of care when patients present with this. Erythropoietin, it's a no, great source. Usually, these people who consume country wine, it's an outbreak. Usually, it is some marriage season and all. They have it, and 10, 13 people, they 
and get admitted in the ward some of them die and it is usually irreversible blindness which we see now of course with if we get it we can try erythropoietin in such cases thank you that might get him more disease actually yeah but it used to be and one of the it, back, it, sir, it yeah. used to be one of the uh, it's, it's used for, in the acute phase it's yeah, a competitive it's, inhibitor of i mean competition for the alcohol dehydrogenase right. which converts uh, to just the first two or three days at the most not now he came five seven days later but if i've been she raised a good question when he got worse did he consume again? <laughs> made himself worse, and just the steroids were what did the. I trick. really didn't think of that. I should have asked. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Ali, uh, your experience on because you handle both neuroophthalmology. No, I don't think I have an experience of treating acute problems because most patients who came to me were patients who have had already steroid, and then come after one month, you know, they go everywhere trying to see whether somebody can offer something different. But I don't think I have managed too many acute patients, except maybe one or two when. Steroids are very, very well known to cause a temporary improvement with a, again a rapid loss of vision. That's very well described with methyl alcohol poisoning. But I think the role of erythropoietin, I was not very sure until I heard your, your excellent talk. So maybe next time I will try. That's, that's a big learning for all of us that there's something more to offer other than steroids. And especially if steroids start failing, then there's, there's one other drug what we can. I just want to have show of hands, like uh, how many of you have heard of erythropoietin being used for methyl alcohol pulp? You have, you have any experience on it? In a sense, have you seen any favorable outcomes as much as like what Shahan has done? Oh, my neurologist friends using it for NMO, and this is what I heard from them, that people have started using for other entities which are affecting the nerve similar on the same belief that if it's occurring, it is helping in NMO and MS patients, it will help here also. Yeah. Right. They're in fact uh, modifying the molecule to remove the uh, adverse effects of increasing the hemoglobin on all that so that they can use it in these conditions. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, Akash, so Akash is going to present a challenging case which was uh, managed by an very old technique of scleral implication in the complex pediatric attachment in a child with incontinent of thickness. Go to your first. Sir. A very good afternoon. So my case is a three-year-old girl child who presented to the clinic with the parents telling that uh, one year of eccentric fixation and the child has become dull since one month and is not playing with toys. So when I examined the child, she looked syndromic with the woolly hair and anomalous dentition and uh, hyperpigmentation all over the uh, skin. So she presented with this kind of a picture, a wild field showing a complex retinal detachment of a fold running from the disc to the periphery with the SRF that is seen temporal in the right eye. And left eye was something like this, where there is a fibrous proliferation which you see here, FVP and a avascular peripheral retina. So for the complex uh, detachment, what I planned was uh, to tackle the complex vector forces. I uh, started imbricating the area where the scleral flap was made, uh, centered at the equator, and these rectangular flaps were uh, sutured with the Dacron uh, 5-0 suture material. So by this, uh, you know, you would approximate uh, the flaps and uh, ca cause the scleral sl shortening. And by this, we get a very high uh, inner indent. And uh, followed this, I did a very, uh, you can say, a mild cryotherapy and a 26 gauge uh, needle drainage and a 287 uh, uh, buckle was put uh, for the two temporal quadrant and a belt buckle encirclage. For the, this is what you see on the post-op uh, day uh, seven, uh, 7, where you see a very high buckle indent, in, including all the uh, tractional element right from the, you know, posterior macula till the periphery. For the left eye, what I planned was uh, minimally uh, invasive, like a 25 gauge, a very minimal vitrectomy to uh, remove all the tractional elements. I did not cause any other uh, vigorous action here because nitrogenic break could be uh, devastating here. So very minimal vitrectomy was done and the peripheral avascular retina was lasered. 
so this is the picture here so the complex case of this was uh, presented like this where the right hand uh, the right eye was managed with scleral imbrication and scleral buckle and the uh, left eye was managed with the vitrectomy so two contrast presentation that you see so i uh, followed this child by teleconsult because they came from bihar and uh, the parents were saying the child was uh, very much active now post surgery and uh, was able to appreciate the aeroplanes that were going above i asked them to send a video after 3 months of surgery and uh, this is what they sent the child is able to fixate better and you know was able to make a contact with the ball and play with the ball and this is what we live for this makes world of difference for the vsa in forest thank you excellent outcome akash now the question to you is uh, because the both has a good indentation effect right to third indentation and used a convex buckle you will use an imbrication technique and over and above that 240 now uh, somewhere back in mind i would have this would it cost an undue very high internal indentation to the tractional fold if that's the desired end point what you had in mind so how are you going to titrate with three variables which you are going to employ in this particular kit so the indication for scleral imbrication is uh, the cases where we cannot do vitrectomy we feel that if you do a vitrectomy then uh, invadent break can cause uh, usage of silicon oil or unfavorable response or unvariable response or the indication is where we feel that serial buckle would give us success then we should go only for a buckle so cases where we think that serial buckle will fail or cases where we think vitrectomy also will fail then those are the cases where we you know where we require a very high indentation to accommodate all the complex vector forces is the indication for this so the indication is not the cases where we think scleral buckle would su uh, be successful uh properly to ask you was there a regma in this case yeah or was it only a trd because uh, the parents said that one year the child had a uh, eccentric fixation but was able to manage but became dull since one month you know, when you operated did you find any break in the retina i cryoed very minimally in the periphery i couldn't so, see obvious so break why ask this question is that it's basically a tractional detachment even a simple encephalage will help in relieving the tractions enough the problem occurs when there is a hole at the edge of the falciform fold very often this occurs when the child is at about 15 16 years of age at the edge of the falciform fold where it meets the ora serrata that area of retina is extremely thin and there when they develop breaks it's very difficult to close them by a regular buckle and that is where a scleral imbrication works because you really shorten the sclera yes the other point i want to have the sclera imbrication which you did it was hardly about One and a half to two clock hours. That is not usually enough. If you want to do sclera imbrication, you should do at least one quadrant, one full quadrant, and the depth to which the sclera should be dissected is almost exposing the parietal. Is to be bluish, absolutely. Only then the imbrication will be nice. Otherwise, the imbrication won't be uh, of much use for you. So this is what I would. But if it is presenting with a regmatogenous detachment, then I would definitely use a combination technique like what you described. But if it is fractional detachment. simple and certainly pixel will suffice in most cases just to add two points so uh, just if i can add two points so there was a, i feel there was a regma because there was a srf that was recent onset according because the child became dull one month and uh, uh, the cases where i have started i have experience in about 10 to 12 eyes where i have done imbrication and this is one of my very early cases as you rightly mentioned that you need to go much more deeper and get a better flap to get a better shortening and uh, two quadrant uh, or at least three quadrant indent to accommodate would be a much ideal one yes i agree on that and i have done what uh, this as well as the uh, uh, like uh, rop cases it's the zone 3 disease where there's fibrous tissue which is equal in the past plana as well as the vitreous space and coming close to the uh, lens so there if you were to go vitrectomy you'll be sacrificing the lens but otherwise the lens is clear So in those situations, and even if you sacrifice the lens, you would have to do a retinectomy, which is not preferable. Those situations, instead of stretching the retina, we shorten the sclera so that the fold opens up. It will work if the there is no retinal retinal adhesion at the falciform fold. If it is not closed and it's uh, broader anteriorly, posteriorly it's narrower, then it may open up, and then the macula may attach. So in those cases, and and like Dr. Elji mentioned, like I usually straddle the lateral retinas, half a quadrant superior temporal, half a quadrant inferior temporal. and deep almost up to like how we used to do a, uh, the inter the, the implant that much of depth and then take a suture and then but, but i have never i think dr subhadra also does this along with the encircling band but i have never done with an encircling band just i uh, just only a uh, imbrication is what i do 
Yeah, liter literature does mention a few cases. Uh, Sleral lubrication itself is sufficient to tackle the complex, but none for pediatric retina. So this is the first time we have tried both just to be on a safer side. Just another point, actually, Tapas, about which you had raised uh, the issue on what happens as when the child grows up, because if there are any changes which you get to see uh, in child's eyes after it's been imbricated, clear has been imbricated. Yeah, I don't have any experience on imbrication. Maybe Dr. Mark. Have a follow-up of at least about 8 to 10 years in a child, again, FEVR. So the eye looks a little small in the initial times, but then subsequently there is not a gross microphthalmia. And again, like these patients, they have a myopia as well. So it seems to compensate. The child is going to attack macula right now with a, with a good vision. and But like I didn't see the eye to become smaller. So another concern is whether there's an astigmatism which is induced because you're grossly contracting it. The initial post-operative period looks a little bit abnormal, but then subsequently it seems to enough. One point of lectures before the era of scleral buckling, this was the technique being used to produce the buckle effect. If it was such a useless technique, it would not have been, been adopted at that time. And the only issue here is that because of the sharp uh, hold we are causing at the choroidal level, whether the long ciliary vessels, long ciliary nerves, are they getting affected? But usually, I think the slope is reasonably smooth for them to be not affected. No, I would like to ask you this. I think basically what we're talking about is retinal shortening. Oh, no, the no. objective of imbrication is actually retinal shortening. Uh, I mean, scleral shortening. So a scleral shortening to manage retinal shortening. Exactly. But now, in this situation, a buckle would have actually given adequate effect. Or, well, you felt even in large wood, I would say I would maximum go to the extent of putting a buckle in that area, reserve the, insert, the imbrication for the most severe cases, where you're sure that you're getting this shortening. Uh, at the retinal level, and which is significant, quite broad-based, which is what you actually said, that it should be more than three clock hours or so, then it makes sense to support the whole area. Uh, considering the negatives with imbrication, I think it's better to first try just buckling in this. Or, uh, you may get away with that in many of the cases. Obviously, do buckle, but I don't think there's any gross negative about imbrication. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, that thank was a very interesting case, an imbrication technique which was uh, started in 1950s and uh, proposed by, uh, I just forgot the name who proposed it. Anyway, so it is a technique which shortens the scleral and it provides a decent amount of indentation, not as much as what the scleral buckle would do. Uh, and in the absence of scleral buckle in these cases, it had that sort of a reputation which I gained uh, many years ago. And uh, a lot of discussion which happened on on how to do the imbrication, how much importance should be involved in imbrication, and what are the later changes which can happen after the imbrication has been done. So with that, we move on to the next case, and the next case would be presented by Dr. Raizada, and it will be on large retinal hole following injury by crease few switch in the ag laser. Good afternoon, everybody. My case is large retinal hole following injury by Q switched NDR laser. I shall be presenting my case by means of an animated explainer video. I hope you all are doing well. I am Dr. Jay. I am going to share with you an intriguing case today. So let's get started without an ado. A 28 year old female dermatology PG resident presented to us with complaints of diminution of vision in the right eye for the past three hours. She gave history of unprotected exposure to Q switched ND YAG laser, which is used for cosmetic procedures in dermatology. Her best corrected vision in the right eye was 1 by 60, while in the left eye was 66. Anterior segment was within normal limits in the right eye. But to our horror, her right eye fundus picture looked like this. A large retinal hole caused by laser burn, approximately four disc diameters in size, located supratemporal to the macula. The hole was seen to bleed fresh blood into the vitreous cavity. Decision to barrage the hole with retina green laser was made. The patient was given anti-inflammatory medication and was asked to maintain a propped up position and to avoid coughing and straining. The patient returned three days later with a BCVA of 6-6 parts showing resolving vitreous hemorrhage. 
Barrage laser marks could be seen all around the hole except for the inferior border because of obscuration by the downflowing thick bloodstream. So in this visit, barrage laser was completed and the patient was asked to take the similar precautions as described before. One week later, the patient continued showing signs of improvement with resolving vitreous hemorrhage and a well-barraged retinal hole. Three weeks later, patient was back at BCV A66. She has been advised regular retina evaluation to look for development of complications like CNVM and ERM. She was advised to always wear safety glasses while doing a laser procedure. Hope you found this case worth your time. We would love to have your valuable inputs. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I just had one question. Did you augment the laser inferiority as well? Yes, sir, we did. In the subsequent visit. Subsequent visit. In the first visit, there was a down downflowing stream of blood. So, barraging that part of the hole was impossible. Right. But one week later, I did barrage. Right. So, thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Salwar, I have a question uh, both for you and for Dr. Prakash as well. So when patients present with an injury like this or even a perforating injury which has a similar type of uh, end result, right, undesirable, so there, there is a discussion or a debate which happens whether you do a laser or take up the patient for early detection. So which one you would like to do and why? Yeah. If it's an attached retina, in an attached retina, I would I would just go ahead and do the laser first, um, and uh, I would probably follow more closely to see the, as soon as the media clears up, uh, the blood clears up, to continue to the, do the laser in areas which are missing. If despite, and I will tell the patient that there's a possibility that may start detaching despite all this. So if that happens, I will take you up for an early surgery. But I'll just keep under a very close follow up, maybe alternate day or once in three days and keep make sure that the laser is complete and with the laser also keep under follow-up because it can still detach despite that and once i once the laser spots have come and it's even and um same with me uh, laser uh, with close follow -up. but some cases what i have done if i find that the edges of the tear are really edematous and uh, appear necrotic i had oral steroid and this helps in early healing process and taking up the laser better okay uh, was anything different from your side? No, I, I agree with the, the comments. That, that's, uh, that those are the critical points in terms of decision making. Very, I mean, I've never seen a case uh, with a, with a, almost like a waterfall of hemorrhage that you were seeing come out. That's quite a quite a substantial injury. I guess this patient still could be at risk for other local problems in that area, the, you know, fertile vascularization and the like. That you know, needs to be monitored for, but uh, but you've solved the main problem. Right. Dr. Deshpande, point from your side. Here, the size of the hole, we are not sure because it is totally covered up with hematoma. Yeah. So you have to go quite far off to do barrage laser. And we are not sure whether the hole would close in such cases. Naturally, close observation is very much indicated. And I think such people they usually go for vitrectomy followed by this the hole will not close in such a big hematoma is there we are not sure how much is the size of hole uh, the only point i have is that uh, unlike a perforating injury with the instrument here you would expect that there is no vitreous disturbance in the first place and from the site of bleeding there is already a thermal injury the area, the tissues, it's more likely to end up in a scar around that area. And it, retinal detachment probably is not an immediate threat. You have enough time to do laser in a very gradual fashion, more to sort of buttress what is already scarring. I would say the risk of detachment is not extraordinarily high. Second point I would like to make is if this paper wins award, you should give it to whom? You or the person who presented? I think there are two important points, like uh, what Dr. Deshpande said, with the hematoma there, doing laser away from the area where the break has really happened, right? It's something which we have to think about. And the second point, which you may, uh, Dr. Elji, I have a question for you. Not a thermal laser, right? NDIAC laser. Do you still feel that there will be some amount of Fourier retinal addition would have happened because of uh, the impact? Okay.
meantime, I, I want to ask you, uh, what is the power which they usually use and is it a continuous laser because... Sir, actually the circumstances in which this injury took place was very bizarre. She was actually a third year postgraduate student and a new NDR laser had been installed in the department. They were quite curious about its functioning. The second year was attempting a cutaneous uh, laser on the third year postgraduate. They weren't really acquainted with the functioning of the laser and it got misfired. The free cosmetic treatment went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that was one big reason that the laser did not hit the center of the macula. Yeah, that's because that's like I just want to know, in contrast to what we used to versus they are using, what is the power which is usually used in Generally this? used 5 to 9 millijoules. They use Five it to two. treat uh, nevus of pota or hori or for tattoo removal. So the power that is generally prescribed for dermatological reasons is generally around 5 to 9 minutes. And is it a continuous laser or is it switched? Ultimate. I just wanted to say that when you when you do this kind of laser, there must be a broad band of laser. You just don't do two rows. You do, you do a broad band. And as Madam said, as the blood clears off, if you see there's more space between the edge of the tear and the area which is lasered, you go inside and do more laser. So that finally you've got the edge covered too. That is what prevents the subsequent uh, detachment in that area. Otherwise you'll be left with a rim of detachment, which could be quite large permanently because it's uh, once it detaches, you can't do anything uh, for this. So the, the only time you will get is when it's attached and when the blood has gone off and there will be such a period. So that is what is important. So I just have a question to the audience. Uh, how many of you would have done a primary vitrectomy if the patient had presented like this. Show of hands, anyone? None of you. Okay. So laser photocoagulation and uh, very valid points in terms of uh, addition around the breaks and in terms of uh, you know, creating or adding more laser as soon as the hemorrhage starts clearing and observing the patient very closely. One last question, because uh, I have seen Dr. Ajit Babu, not there. So when he used to do this retinal anastomosis, which was proposed by Dr. Ian Constable then for central retinal vein occlusions, uh, I, sometimes I could see this new vascularization from these areas hanging, it is like chandeliers. So I'm not sure, uh, was if you have seen anything of these? Oh yeah, well, I mean, that, that's, a devis, uh, that's a very difficult to treat problem. This choroidal retinal hyaloidal proliferation is a real challenge. And so, I mean, I presume that this kind of an interruption is at risk for that type of a complication. I mean, this patient is going to need some long-term monitoring. Right. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Shiti. We'll move on to the next case. And next case is another case where an injury occurred after peribulbar anesthesia and caused a 360-degree retinal dialysis. I think that proliferation which you're talking about, the retinal, what uh, Sada was mentioning, that doesn't happen. That happens in the, again, the background of a ischemia. So in a CRV, in a CRV, like that's what I have also treated that. So there, there is the, the concept, of the uh, underlying thing of ischemia, that's why it proliferates. But in this patient, there's no ischemia, so it may not. That's that's a good point. It's probably going to be self-limited. Obviously, you can get, uh, you know, for example, in the monkey model, just by rupturing Brooks membrane, you can transiently get neovascularization. But as Dr. Mahesh points out, because you don't have a, a underlying driver, the neovascularization may spontaneously involute as well. But this retinal ischemia, isn't it? So we are talking about new vessels coming from the choroid. No, it's because you've interrupted Brooks membrane that you have a path for the vessels to come. But there may not be a major impetus to keep them going. Okay. So we move on. Uh, Good afternoon. A 75-year-old female presented with, uh, was referred to us with history of left eye cancer phaco surgery the previous day due to development of hyphema and hypotony after peribulbar block. Reported exhale length was normal. Examination showed left eye visual acuity only perception of light. Mild congenital chemosis, hazy cornea, hyphema, no way of lens or iris or fundus and IOP was 4 millimeter of mercury. So we did ultrasound. It was not in our department. It was in the department of radiology. There was choroidal hemorrhage, choroidal detachment with hemorrhage, and there is a crumpled hyperechoic tissue temporally. And another view showed little disorganized internal structures. And another also confirmed the choroidal detachment, and another side crumpled hyperechoic tissue. So diagnosis was 
a glow penetration with vitreous hemorrhage, choroidals and RD due to peribulbar injection. So we took her to surgery after 10 days. Our video was not working. So these are the pictures. So we did the uh, uneventful FACO and after that we noticed hypotonies. We explored the glow and we found a limbus parallel 6 millimeter scleral perforation, a scleral wound about 8 millimeter posterior to the uh, limbus. It was sutured. And then we did a coral drainage and did 25 gauge vitrectomy, vitreous hemorrhage was cleared. After vitreous hemorrhage was cleared, we found the whole retina was detached and it was wrapped like a napkin and it was attached at one end to the disc and another was going towards the wound. The whole thing was incarcerated the wound. So there are the 360 degree dialysis of retina, the incarceration of the retina in the wound uh, was seen. So this is the picture, you can see that the whole retina is going up from the disc to the wound. And all the thing you are seeing is actually the bare RP. So we did, there was no other way than to do endocautery and release the incarceration, then 360 retinectomy. We tried to remove membranes from the posterior surface of the uh, retina. We also tried to remove whatever membranes we could see from the, uh, the, uh, the anterior surface of the retina. And then we injected PFCL. And uh, when we did PFCL silicone injection, unfortunately the wound started bleeding and we could not remove PFCL completely. So um, one week post-op, her visual acuity had improved to counting finger half foot. There was subretinal PFCL temporarily and the retina was detached there. So she agreed for another surgery 24 days after the first surgery. The silicone oil and uh, PFCL were removed. The temporal retina had rolled out on itself, out actually, and it was contracted. We tried to remove the membranes and we did bimanual also. It was a little uh, fruitless. We could only do uh, partial uh, justice. A PF cell injection was done, more laser was done, and PF cell silicon oil exchange was done. This is what we found during surgery. You can see that the retina is crumpled there and inverted on itself outside, uh, actually, and some part of the retina flat. This is one month after surgery, partially attached retina with silicon oil, and the counting finger, the vision was only counting finger, half foot. Patient did not follow up after six weeks. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Vani. That, that's one of the most challenging cases. Right. So when I when I hear this case for the first time or read about this case, so there will be <laughs> taking the, the benefit of the hindsight. Right? So there will be a school of people who would be thinking whether an intervention in the initial trauma phase have been more an ideal circumstance for management of this patient or a delayed intervention could have led to such kind of an little time. Absolutely, I agree with you. I absolutely so, agree with you. Actually, uh, there, there were are two schools of thought. Yes. Like, so, which one you would? Uh, I would rather to... intervene early. Actually, I told her we'll do early, but she had insurance issues. She was a ECHS patient, so she had issues with this one, and she was also reluctant initially. Okay. Reluctant also. She was because she had she had very uneventful cataract surgery. The other eye, she was seeing six nine. So this eye suddenly it was less. So she was and she was little reluctant. So the main purpose of presenting this case is to raise the awareness that. There is a condition called globe explosion. A globe perforation, we have, most of you have encountered. A peribulbar block is given and there is a vitreous hemorrhage or something of that sort, then the retinal tear or retinal detachment or, or injury to the optic nerve. But when the, the injecting doctor goes on injecting, the eye gives way and it breaks either at the limbus or at the uh, posterior sclera or somewhere around the aura. So if it is at limbus, the things are little better. Sometimes the lens gets extruded into the subconjunctal space. And Dr. Manish Nakpal has reported one case like that, actually. And uh, or else, if it is clearer, it becomes very difficult. There is only one case reported from PGI Chandigarh, one of the three cases where the whole retina was dialyzed, actually. Right. And in our case, the whole not, it was not only dialyzed, the whole thing was stuck in the wound. So actually, we should have done, I, I think my takeaway home points are we should do surgery early, I feel to prevent uh, fibrosis. I don't know what is the view of uh, Dr. Lingam Gopal and others right. actually. So, uh, that's why I take uh, Dr. Gopal's opinion, Dr. Talwar and Dr. Deshpande, your opinion as well. So uh, the question is, would you have intervened at the same visit when the patient had an injury or would have taken up later? Question number one. Question two is, if you had to do a surgery, what differently you would have done? First question, <laughs> the first thing before this is, would I have recognized something is not quite all right? So, so there were three stages. One was when the injection was being given. The person who was giving, there would have been a transient phase when the cornea became absolutely white. 
and after that only it will start recovering. That's the stage you should know that something has happened, that something build up the pressure and now release the pressure. But doesn't matter, you missed that stage because uh, somebody is not watching and now you patient comes to me, the patient has come with a choroidal which is a suprachoroidal hemorrhage, that much I'm sure. But, he, but the patient has hypotony, which means that there is a likelihood that there is an open wound somewhere. I cannot say where it's there, but I know <laughs> there is an open wound. So I would have asked for a CAT scan. That's the first thing. Because you'll get to know that there's a discontinuity in the layers. Once you know there's a discontinuity in the layers, then I may not do the vitreoretinal surgery, but I would have wanted the scleral wound to be repaired. That is the important thing. And when it was repaired, at that time, that gel vitreous part of it would have been removed. You could still have got the incarceration, but the likelihood was less. Once that is over, then the secondary surgery, including the suprachoroidal removal, I would do at 10 days old. I would not try to do that on the second day. I can't take it out. Fair enough. So, so I could understand and that you uh, know, in one, the presence of a suprachoroidal hemorrhage and the presence of hypotony, you would have requested for a CT CAT scan that's right. to see for days into the globe. And then go on with and, the primary. And that should be usually done with one millimeter sections. Yeah. The mistake that happens is if you don't specify, they will do five millimeter sections, yeah. nothing will come. Yeah. And one last thing, there are two points from where the dehiscence of the globe occurs. Either it's limbal or it occurs at the insertions Insertion of, of the um, extracular muscles, usually the temporal one. But so, which is what happens. Dr. Okay. Deshwani, quick comments from your side. First thing, uh, axial length was just 25 millimeter. That means the patient was not high myopic. And to have such kind of thing, rarely in peribulbar block rather than can happen in retrobulbar blocks and the way you inject it. And Sir has rightly said that you have to watch when you are giving you know, retrobulbar or peribulbar injection. Patient would complain of severe pain. And you have to see, these days you do not operate mostly in macho cataracts. You can see the glow also, the uh, wonder glow. So naturally, you have to stop at that point. If it occurs, then it is always better to go on watching, have a CT scan and see the scleral tear first, repair it and then only go for a return. I think very similar to what Dr. Talwar had said. Uh, regarding uh, anesthesia, I would like to just add a point. There is very typical uh, circumstance in which this globe exploration occurred, uh, perform, um, globe explosion occurred. The PG gave block in the inferior, this one, it elevates the globe. Now the PG didn't stop there. Now the eye is anesthetized. They, he went on to give it in the superior nasal quadrant. Now the globe is elevated and you are going through the this one and the, you are perforating the uh, sorry, you are uh, in entering the eye and injecting because the globe is already anesthetized by peribulbar block inferiorly, patient did not have pain. I asked the whole history and this is what was narrated. The patient never had pain during the surgery even when it exploded. So this was what and actually all the, are about, there are about 11 or 12 cases in the literature and almost all have similar way of things during a peribulbar block. Most of them are given one inferiorly another superior. So it is our duty as vitreoidal surgeons to raise awareness among the general ophthalmologists that you give only one sight block and stick to it. No, no, or, the problem is not that. What happens is when you go from this, when you are giving the superior one, you need to feel the roof of the orbit when you keep giving. What happens is people just tend to go straight down. When you're going straight down, actually the roof of the orbit is curved and you're not following the curve. You're going straight <laughs> in. And in this, as you said, elevated eye, you're obviously penetrating. So if you stick to the, if you stay next to the roof, you're feeling that, you will not get into trouble. This only happens when you don't do that. Right. So uh, I have uh, amongst the audience, if anybody would have done anything differently and done, what would it be like? Second surgery, I would have probably left the blood fluorocarbon as the tampon because mm -hmm. the retina is contracted and you are unable to make intrinsic contraction. Then I would have left blood fluorocarbon and then replace it silicon oil about a couple of weeks. Ago. So I'm based in the UK. 
and uh, uh, retrobulbar or peribulbar blocks are bl banned there, we give some tenons anesthesia. So it's a very controlled retrobulbar anesthesia, and that stopped this problem. Absolutely. I always give subtenon for all my vitreoretinal surgeries. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, so we move Thank on you, to the sir. next case. Uh, it will be a case presented by Dr. Prashant Jain. Windows to well of okay. Evening all. I am presenting a case of 48 year old male who presented to us with diminution of vision right eye for past three months. Best corrected visual equity in right eye was hand movement in left eye with plus one, six, twelve, and six. On examination, AC was quiet, lens was clear, AC was shallow. Uh, there was no other systemic illness. So, on fundus examination, uh, in right eye, there was 360 degree corroded detachment with serious retinal detachment. In left eye, there was corroded detachment in periphery with few ILM poles. So we did OCT, there was marked serious retinal detachment in red, right eye. Left eye, shallow SRA was there. On FFA, we have sealed uh, motel, leopard mottling in both eyes without any leak. Axial length was normal. UBM showed ciliary effusion and we have made the diagnosis of UBL effusion syndrome. We started the patient on IV methyl pad 1 gram for 3 days, followed by oral steroid for 2 weeks. But patient doesn't respond to steroid therapy. So we decided to perform full thickness sclerosamine in inferior to quadrant in right eye. So uh, we did 6 mm away from the limbus, 5 into 2 mm scleral flap were made and choroid was exposed and then with scaly sponge we have made sclerotomy in both sides and sutured with 8-0 Vicrin. So on first day there was marked decrease in serous retinal detachment and BCV was 636 and 24. Even on OCT there was improvement. So we have sent the sclera for the histopath and section source abnormal sclera with disorganization of collagen fiber bundles and deposits of proteoglycans in the matrix on ancient blue staining. But after a week, there was again recurrence, 660 and 36 for the vision. So we decided to perform resurgery. We have increased the size of the sclerostomy. And this time I have cut down the sclera and sutured the conjectiva over the bare choroid. So this was the difference in resurgery. I have cut down the scleral flap. Size of sclerostomy was increased and conjectiva was sutured over the bare choroid. So first day there was marked decrease in serous retinal detachment, BCV was 618 and 12. And subsequent follow up there was gradual decrease in the serous retinal detachment along with corroded detachment. This is one month post op, there was shallow SRA was seen. This is three month, there was periphery some corroded det detachment is still there. Six month post op there was complete resolution of the SRF along with corroded detachment and patient BCV is 69 and 6. Left eye was maintaining state okay. There was corroded detachment in the periphery, but the macula was okay. And vision was 612. So full thickness sclerosmy surgery is an effective treatment in type 1 and type 2 uvalu effusion syndrome. Our case was type 2 who responded well to surgery even with two sclerosmy windows in inferior quadrant. And on last follow-up at six months, the BCV was 69 with flat retina. This challenging case is being presented to create awareness about this entity, diagnosis and difficulties in its management. Thank you. Thank you so much that you were able to pick up this case and treat it adequately. So uh, my question was like, if you have a patient whom you diagnose to have uveal effusion, so what would be your indications when you would subject the patient for an intervention? Well, I, I think that uh, vision is obviously a big uh, factor. A lot of these, some, some patients may not have uh, fluid that extends into the macula and maybe you might observe for some time, but uh, but most of the patients that at least come to me in my practice, usually they've been seeing someone else, and by the time they come, they have that. Uh, and so once the vision is impacted, there's uh, submacular fluid, I think the patients need intervention. I've never found much success in my hands with steroids. I have to say, I'm very curious to see in the audience how many people have seen resolution with that. It's never worked for me. So these patients have always gone to uh, scleral windows, but I'm very interested to see if others have had Success. I, I'm also curious to see in this group whether anyone does ultra wide field ICGA or to look to see um, the uh, the vortex uh, vein anatomy. It's interesting since we had published a study on norm the normative um, the vortex vein anatomy, and there's actually quite an interesting variation. I mean, sometimes classically we're taught that we have four, four vortex vein ampulla uh, in the, uh, the the equator. That's not true. There's actually a tremendous at least. I shouldn't say that, I should say at least what we see in the eye, that's not true. There may be sort of retro scleral kind of uh, anastomosis or something that's happening, but at least uh, inside the eye, we can sometimes see many, many ampulla and the like. And you wonder 
uh, you know, when you extended your sclerotic, perhaps you got better decompression because of the unique anatomy uh, of the particular uh, patient. And so uh, I don't know if uh, here anyone does a more targeted sort of approach in terms of the selection of the location of the windows. Generally, we haven't historically, but that was before we had this information from ultrawide field ICGA. I think those are important. Probably I can put out to the audience here. Uh, the first question which was asked, like uh, the role of steroids. Somebody, some some people do use steroids in the management of mineral diffusion. Uh, I think based on, first it's based on uh, uh, Shields group which uh, had proposed steroids, right? And thereafter it has been used. Like how many of you use steroids when a patient presents with mineral diffusion before you make a cut down? So sizable population who Michael's shaking his head so I want to hear what he says. I miss you actually. So my understanding of the pathology is that you have thickened impervious sclera that prevents the protein from getting out of the choroid and it's not you know in the, historically gas would talk about pressure on the vortex veins and you can release that but you can do the scleral windows have nothing to do with the veins and you fix the problem um so i would say one don't do a drainage procedure because that's not really that's temporary and it's not going to fix the problem you need to do wide based windows 90 percent thickness and also though the fluid accumulates inferiorly don't do just inferior windows do four quadrants because it's really a four quadrant disease it's just a gravity pulls things down to the bottom because you want protein to go from everywhere. So uh, anybody who would like to, uh, how does the window work? Windows decrease resistance to albumin flow from the choroid to the extraocular space because you're decreasing the amount of distance they need to go through. Well, you. Dr. Talwar, actually, sclera is causing the resistance. Sclera is causing the resistance because it's primarily a scleral disease. So, uh, uveal effusion per se, it's the disease is not in the uveal. It's the disease of the sclera. Yes. Through the sclera, through the vortex. That, that's where it drains out. But, but. Are you saying from side the vortex? In patients with. In that, what I'm asking you is. I don't think so. It's a it's, it's the type of the sclera which is there, which is causing the resistance in this patient. Yes. I mean, I can understand to open the vortex vein area, but take a window away from the vortex. Why should that work? It just helps the further dissemination of a congested sclera, one the, sorry, congested choroid. It has diffusion of the fluid which because of the congestion. And it just lets it out. No, but, but, but Dr. Teller is asking, is there actually fluid flow directly through the scleral substance, or does it have to take other routes? Because generally, there are other routes in terms of the uveal scleral flow. It's not It doesn't pass through the sclera like a sieve. I mean, that's not how the sclera operates. It not pass like a sieve, but it does penetrate the scleral fibers. Because if you have operated, if you have done implant technique, in patients who have had a choroidal detachment or a soft eye, you will find that the sclera is all edematous. What is edema? Edema is nothing but fluid within the sclera. So it does, fluid can enter the sclera. The point here is that by, by reducing the scleral thickness at a longer, I mean, a larger surface area, you reduce the resistance of fluid to come out and hence permit the choroid to restore to its normalcy. That's it, nothing more than that. It's, it's, it's not a flow in that sense of the word. It is probably 
some sort of a balance probably <laughs> Why the disease happened? You know, if if my understanding is is it's not one point where the occlusion has happened. In fact, occlusion does not is not there in this particular patient. It's it's a uniform abnormality of the sclerum, which can be uh, complete or it related to the choroid, which is not allowing the the fluid to pass out through the vortex is not my understanding. Why <laughs> so if it makes you feel better, think of the abnormal sclera is compressing the vortex veins. So there are two ways to fix it. One is to decompress the vortex veins, which can work. But the easier way is to get a bypass procedure through the slur. If that makes more sense. One comment. Yeah. So two comments on the case. Uh, one thing is if, if the patient presents with uveal effusion very acutely, should rule out uh, drug-related toxicity, topiramate and other drugs. Second thing is about leaving the choroid bare under the conjunctiva. I think that's a threat. It can uh, stimulate sympathetic ophthalmia. Yes. I think sympathetic ophthalmia is something which we have no control over. If it has to happen, as like as cases trivial as cryopexy is also for sympathetic ophthalmia. That's, that's one way of looking at it. So, uh, I think uh, that will, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dane, for that. So, we'll go on to the next case. It's a, a curious case of bilateral hypertension and neonate. Thanks, PRSI, for giving me this opportunity. So, my patient was an uh, eight days old baby, uh, born out of full term normal vaginal delivery, was referred with complaints of redness and proptosis of both eyes. And from the history, the child had mild fever on second day, but the child was taking proper feed and all, and started developing a discharge from both eyes, started right, first with the right eye from third day. The baby was otherwise systemically stable, uh, was treated with the topical uh, topramycin eye drops. From the history, uh, other than that, the, the mother had uh, some uh, suspected oral herpes-like lesions, for which uh, uh, they had taken some ointment, that topical application is what mother said, and could not get much details regarding the same. There was worsening of the ocular condition. So when we saw the baby uh, on eighth day, when the baby was referred, this was a picture where there was periorbital swelling with ecchymosis, proptosis, and IOP was digitally high with high femur precluding further fundus details. A B scan was done, which showed increase in the RCH uh, complex, and there was a few vitreous echoes was there with the subtenal fluid. So with the, all these uh, features, the differentials was first endogenous endophthalmitis, but there were no exudates, no ALO glow was not there. With the history of uh, uh, viral infection in mother, suspected whether it was a viral uh, hemorrhagic conjunctivitis with some retinitis or some blood dyscrasia altogether because of the high femur, which was there bilateral. Anyway, the child was already on IV meropenem uh, and uh, isoclovir because of the viral etiology. A systemic evaluation was done extensively for the child and which showed actually in the MRI multiple ring enhancing lesions so from their report, it was suggestive of more of a bacterial uh, infection. So the cyclography was stopped and we tried because the microbiology evaluation otherwise was negative. We went ahead with an AC type, but could not get enough sample because it was more of like an organized one and the child was given intravitreal. On follow-up, you could uh, see that the uh, chemosis and the high femur had come down, but you could see that there was an yellow organized exudates in the anterior chamber, but B scan showed a worsening of the vitreous echoes. So we thought we went ahead with the vitrectomy to see because still the diagnosis was in confusion. 
So this was the intro picture, which was uh, like uh, the, there was corneal edema. We could manage to uh, dislodge the clot or the uh, exudate formed exudate from the anterior chamber, but the cornea has become really edematous. So went ahead with the uh, therapeutic PK. Could see that the cornea was extremely thick and the lens was adherent to the uh, endothelium. So it everything came out in like one single. Uh, piece and uh, the iris was totally uh, necrotic. There was no oozing from the iris. When I went inside, it was the uh, vitreous was like white fluffy uh, exudates and no vascularity could be seen. And the so-called maybe the retina was like a yellow membrane kind of thing. Still, we went ahead and sent a uh, sample for uh, PCR, which showed uh, bacillus cereus to be the organism. So we don't know how the baby acquired this. Okay, so we have to stop here. So it's very unfortunate that the child had to get blind. Child had to get gone. Now, uh, just an information uh, like acute uh, post operative cases where the major cause of the organism causing endothelitis happens in non virulent organisms, the triangulation negative stuff. What we have found in a case, I think we are also part of the tour of them, that okay. where in neonatal endothelitis, uh, it's a very virulent organism to present with. So, the chance of uh, uh, equating with the management as acute post operative endothelitis is not occur in someone's mind. So, you have a limited time frame where you have to make a quick diagnosis, make the right judgment calls, and start the treatment. But even then, sometimes the outcome is unfavorable, just uh, and you saw what it would have been otherwise. So, uh, my question is, uh, is Dr. Dr. Rishwan, could you have done anything? Or there are any call like any way by which you would have picked up or you suggest to pick up endothelitis in your unit? You know, first of all, we thought about the viral etiology and antiviral we have given. So is that the reason that the uh, bacterial endothelitis has increased? That was on neurophenomenons. Child was treated with midopenin and acyclovir. So, what I feel that antiviral will not have any role because we have to aggressively put on anti uh, antibiotic only, even the topical. Uh, and, and yeah, your point will take. So, just go with antibiotics, not with antiviral in this cell. So, Child was otherwise fine actually. Feeding and mild fever was there on second day. Because uh, this is not an exogenous endothelitis. It's an endogenous. No, endogenous. endogenous. An endogenous endothelitis and almost gone into panoptonal. Yeah. Yes. So the point is that there has to be some source, some reason why the endogenous endothelitis occurred. So what is the previous history and what were the in the systemic examination? Were the parameters deranged? Was, was the ESR high? Was the yeah, ESR was high? Was the blood was culture done? Blood culture, urine culture, CSF culture, all these things turned out to be negative. So brain enhancing from basically they need to be treated like uh, meningitis, full full doses of uh, for the infection. But if you got this kind of picture, the more you actually fell. Try to go in as early as possible, though it's tough, but the earliest you can. And in intravitreal as soon as you can. Um, and the intravitreal in this situation would possibly be either miropenem or tazobactam along with vancomycin. Yeah, we had given tazobactam. Was, was this bacillus sensitive to your your uh, No, the thing is we could put only PCR. Culture did not do anything. Did not so, and how often do you you get brain abscesses from this bacillus species? Very rare. It's very rare. I, I mean, I, I guess I just sometimes, I mean, of course, whenever we, when a case comes for someone, this is a neonate, so it's different, but people, if somebody presents brain abscesses and endothelitis, I'm thinking about nocardia, that's not what this case is, but you still wonder, you always worry whether the organism that you found, whether it's actually the one or if there's something more fastidious. Uh, happening only because I've just never seen, I, I mean, that's why I was curious, and you've probably done the research, to see the frequency of seeing a bacillus brain abscess, I haven't seen that. I think there is one case report here, I think you think more in terms of trauma for bacillus, 
the question is where did this i mean where was the trauma that caused this to happen i'm like because go back to the trauma also. not direct trauma i'm talking of some trauma is usually the cause but where the brain abscess where would the initial site come from that's the whole issue and why bacillus no So that, yeah, that's the whole point. Like, uh, if you remember, that's the reason why I don't ask for share this the confusion. So you hear this confusion, and I'm happy that it just gave very little. But given some bias, some other backing, and one day it would have created more confusion. So that's what we did. I also wanted to raise the point that most probably it was panophthalmitis right from the beginning, bilateral panophthalmitis. Then we must go all out to rule out a bacterial septicemia. So um, it, it was done actually. When the by the time the baby has reached the uh, end of the mitosis. Yeah, by the time the baby has reached it, they are already uh, done, even including the CS of three. It's it's very unusual and the way it presented and there was no X-rays. No, 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 no,
Good afternoon, everyone. Ocular parasitosis in humans is more prevalent in geographical areas where environmental factors and poor sanitary conditions favors the parasitism between man and animals. Nematode infection of the eye was first reported in the year 1950. They may cause profound visual loss. In case one 51 year old male presented with a gradual blurring of vision in the right eye for the 15 days. Visual equity in the right eye was 20 by 80. Fundus examination showed blurring of the disc margin with vascular cupping and two motile pre-retinal worms can be seen, one inferior and one temporal to the fovea with eye lobe folds. OCT, OCT picture shows vitreous cells with inner retinal hyperreflectivity, cystoid macular edema and worms in the pre-retinal space. So laser photocoagulation to the worm was done. Oral elmedazole 400 mg once a day for 10 days was given. Oral and topical steroid treatment in tapering dose was also given. At one month follow, visual equity showed an improvement with resolution of the macular edema. In case 254 year old male presented with the pain and blurring of vision in the left eye for three days. Visual equity was 6 by 9 in the left eye. Fundus examination showed light worms with regular movements over the retinal surface outside the supratemporal arcade. OCT macula shows normal foveal contour with vitreous cells and OCT passing through the worm shows subretinal fluid, intraretinal fluid and back shooting because of the worm. So due to high motility of the worm, laser treatment was unsuccessful. So oral albendazole 400 mg stat along with 3 ml of peribubble lignocaine was given and then laser photocoagulation was done. Oral topical steroid along with NSAIDs was given. At one month of follow-up, OCT showed resolution of the macular edema with, re with uh, residual scarring. This is a flowchart showing the classification of the worms. So diffuse unilateral subacute neuroretinitis, it is a progressive ocular infectious disease caused by various species of nematodes, which leads to inflammation and degeneration of the outer retina and the retinal pigment epithelium. In the early stage of the disease, it is characterized by the prominent pephritis, papillitis, vasculitis, and retinitis. And the late stage of the disease is characterized by the optic atrophy, arterial attenuation, and RPE degeneration. In the case report published by Mint et al., in which they concluded that if the worm is visible, laser photocoagulation is the treatment of choice. So the take-home message is identification of the clinical signs and diagnosis of retinal worm in the early stage followed by prompt location and destruction of, by photocoagulation may improve the vision of the affected patient. Also, their relationship with geographical areas is helpful in deciding the treatment regimen. These are my references. This is the small video which we tried to capture of the motile worm. Thank you so much. Great. Uh... Picture, I just had a question. What was the indication of uh, peribulbar for anesthesia? So, peribulbar uh, lidocaine is a, it is a topical uh, anesthetic agent. So, it blocks the nerve conduction of the, uh, the parasites. So, it blocks the uh, nerve conduction and it paralyzes the worm. Peribulbar? Yes, sir. It's given in the liter literature. Yeah, but how does it, how does it have an effect? Uh, sir, by diffusion, um, if I get it at paralysis, the eye or the worm? The worm. Uh, can I? Sir, no. uh, it is based on the literature. We tried to. Can I comment? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I do agree with this, but this is what happens that when we have these highly motile worms, they move so fast. It's in that glimpse of the video also you can see it because they are so wild, highly motile, you can't laser them. You can't hit them without with them being stable. So when you do give a peribulbar block, I don't know how it actually ends up to the worm, but it does decrease the motility of the worm. We have seen this across many cases. Okay. So sometimes, sometimes even a topical anesthetic slows it down because the moment you flash the light into it, it starts moving around wild. So sometimes even with a topical anesthetic, it works. When it doesn't, we give a peribulbar. And that's why even actually the albendazole was given with, and the, we waited for a few hours in this case. And then the worm became sluggish. And that's when we could actually laser it to sort of kill it actually. Okay. Uh, just in regard to the same, actually one of the things about this is with light they move more. So why will decreasing the light to the very minimum required for your visualization decrease that motility? 
because rather than i mean that you you do everything yeah. if you want to make it even further uh, sluggish what is inciting it is the light so if you if you decrease your background light so that you just have the visualization minimum light needed and then use the laser possibly yeah. the movement would But be less possibly there's just a couple of uh, uh, points in terms of uh, location locating the worm so you had uh, Uh, presented a patient who had a larger worm, right? So the subset of patients who we miss are the ones with the smaller worms, right? So how do you identify the smaller worms? Uh, sometimes we will not be able to see. Yeah. There are a few clues which I would like to give. One mm -hmm. is uh, there are crops of lesions which start yeah. happening in patients with USN. They usually involve one quadrant to begin with, right? And then evanescent. Mm -hmm. Enough that what Dr. Gass had described that mm -hmm. if there is mutes which is not responded in three weeks or four weeks think about a possible of dus so the outer retinal crops which are evanescent and adjacent to that you will be able to see this very small worm so locate the crops right number two is take a photograph and enlarge the photograph enlarge the photograph and what we have to see is a structure of six or inverted nine they will be a curled on one end it have been curled together i'm talking especially of the small worms Right? So those are the ways by which we will be able to pick it up. And third, third is uh, sometimes when you have done a laser photocoagulation in an area where these outer retinal crops are there, right? uh, if you want to really be sure that you have hit the worm, after you have done a photocoagulation, when you call back the patient uh, a week later, you will be able to see an, uh, amongst the laser scar, there will be a point where there will be a hypertrophied scar. That means you have hit the worm. Right. So these are the ways by which you can, you know, uh, identify the worm before or after. And in terms of uh, initiating an anti-helminthic treatment, so just one point I would like to stand corrected in your presentation was very rarely a patient with USM presents with severe vitreitis. They don't usually present with severe vitreitis. Okay. So uh, at least in this subcontinent, we don't get to see them with severe vitreitis. And having said that, uh, because you want an anti-helminthic which does not cross the blood retinal barrier right uh, as easily because the eye is not very inflamed yeah, yeah. you do a laser photocoagulation photo. around where these areas of crops crops are there you not only kill the worm if you accidentally you if the worm has passed by you 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 create uh, or you destroy the blood retinal barrier there by doing photocoagulation by the inflammation and then you enhance the anti-helminthic getting into the eye Right. So in the absence of vitreitis, these are the two ways by which you can help in the management of right. these cases. Now, do we have to use steroids in these patients? May yeah. not. May not have. Right. You may not have to because the inflammation is not very intense. Mm. And second is, uh, uh, if someone has a multi-spot laser, that is one of the best lasers managed for worms like this. And then you don't have to worry where the head and tail is, where it is moving. So one, you know, one sweep, you are all gone. Right. So that's that's other advantage you can have when you have a multi-spot laser. With. So those are the few tips which you can not require. No, no, they are actually given so that when they die, they may cause a reaction. But it, it does not. It usually does not. Yeah, so, but that's the basic fear yeah. that there may be a reaction incited when they die. So prophylactically, it's better to give steroids. Anyway, it's this, a knee-jerk reaction. This is not required. So it's not required and. And the reason is, when you have an helminthic treatment, uh, the next question is how long anti-helminthic? Because the literature has Funny. like from three days to 30 days, right? That's the duration which different people have anti-helminthic treatment. That again depends on uh, if the patient has a systemic involvement, right? But and you know that it's just not the eye. They must like say, for example, scutaneous lower, lower migrants. It would have gone through the leg and come into the eye. It would have gone through the rest of the body also. So. These are the patients where you have to, depending upon the type of the worm which you suspect, should be the duration of your anti-elementary treatment, right? Yeah, so I mean, it cannot be just, I'll give only for three days, I'll give only for 30 days. So understand the worm and then you decide on the treatment yeah. as well. Sorry? Parameter is depends on whatever causes whitening, depending upon the type of laser. You. I will just look at the end result. It just caused whitening, which is.
No, no, no. I mean, I, what I mean, what is the parameter? Uh, you can see the laser reaction of the surrounding retina regarding treating the worm. What is your parameter? The parameter worm will come to a stop, will not move. So the desired result of after doing the laser photocopy, the worm will stop moving. Stop moving. That's with the larger worms. Smaller worms, sometimes by that time, it will escape actually. So, uh, right. We move on to the last case for uh, this afternoon, and it is going to be another very interesting case of brain fog and vascular clog in unique presentation. Good evening, everyone. So, I'll be presenting an interesting case of a 37 year old female who presented to us with sudden onset defective vision in both her eyes for the about six weeks. She had a history of developing altered sensorium about two months back, for which she was hospitalized in a local general hospital and was treated as a suspect uh, infectious encephalitis. She uh, also had low hemoglobin, for which she received uh, blood transfusion. During her hospital stay there for three weeks, she also developed sudden onset diminished vision and severe hearing loss. And this is when, uh, after discharge from stabilizing her general condition, she was referred to our hospital. So when she came to us, she was conscious, but still appeared con confused and not fully oriented, although her vitals were uh, stable. Her vision was 1 by 60 in the right eye and 636 in the left eye. The fundus picture was very striking. The right eye, as you can see, showed a pale disc, sclerosed cord-like vessels, both arteries and veins, and multiple hemorrhages in all quadrants, and this typical yellow punctate reflectile uh, deposits along the vessel course and the cholesterol deposits at the macula. This is the composite picture of the right eye. And the left eye similarly had a similar appearance with much more dense marked hemorrhages. And this is a, sim a picture of the left eye. OCT showed severe thinning with fused inner retinal layers in the right eye. And the left eye, the OCT, as you can see, the nasal aspect of macula was partly spared, which was po possibly causing uh, some preserved vision in that eye. FFA picture was even more striking. The right eye had near total non-perfusion of the retina with just stopping short beyond the disc. And the left eye again had a severe extensive uh, non-perfusion. Just the infranasal quadrant was partially spared, which was partly supplying the macula, fortunately, for the patient. And if you look in the infranasal quadrant, there were multiple areas of vessel wall staining apart from the CNP areas. So we had at our hands a bilateral combined vascular occlusion and the left eye partial sparing of the IMQ. So at this point, we were considering our DDs under inflammatory, infectious, and coagulopathy categories. And we sent the patient for a thorough systemic workup with the, and a neurologist, ENT specialist, physician consultations. And her basic blood workup came out all negative. Her uh, MRI CNS showed white matter lesions in the right temporal lobe. The pure tone audiometry established uh, the, the sense of neural hearing loss bilaterally. And based on her constellation of symptoms, her clinical presentation, and ruling out all other DDs which could possibly explain her symptoms by various tests, we came to the diagnosis of exclusion, which is the uh, Suzak syndrome. So the patient was, uh, from our side, underwent PRP in both the eyes. The right eye remained stable with poor vision. However, the left eye developed uh, VH and uh, had a drop in vision, for which she underwent vitrectomy with oil. And post uh, uh, oil, she was doing fine. And post SOR, about six, uh, it's been six months, and she's maintaining 624 vision. So why Suzak? Because she was a young female in her late 30s. Three is to one female to male preponderance is reported. She had a classical triad of encephalopathy, sensory neural hearing loss, and RTL occlusion, uh, which is uh, this thing. And she had uh, those typical yellow refractile uh, plaques along the arterioles, which are described by Donald Gass. And they are so typical, they are named, uh, they're called gas plaques, and they're pathonomic. Again, there was uh, arterial wall hyperfluorescence on FA, which is again described to be pathonomonic of uh, Suzak. And the hearing loss, as was confirmed on uh, pure tone audiometry. And MRI brain showing the periventricular white matter lesions. So the unique case, uh, uniqueness about this case was, although Suzak is reported to have multiple episodes of BRAOs, there are some cases where CRAOs, even sequential CRAOs have been reported. But this is, this we couldn't find any other case where bilateral combined vascular occlusion has been reported in Suzak. So I uh, thank you for your patience. Aditya, when, when you just saw case for the first time, right, we have heard that this does not fit the bill. Pardon, sir? Suzak. Does not fit the bill in terms of Suzak. Yes. Right? 
So right from central nervous system, if you see, uh, the corpus callosum so, has to get in, yes. right? And were so, there corpus callosum lesions? No, so there were no corpus so callosum lesions, but it is not a, it, absence of that does not rule out uh, Suzak. But, but you have so many atypical factors, now, right? This is an I extremely understand. severe presentation. I've never seen a Suzak case this bad. Uh, the absence of corpus callosum lesions is concerning. Also, you didn't explain to us why did this patient have such a severe anemia initially? So could be so they had uh, like I said she was investigated uh, she was admitted with actually. No, with, I, I understand that they may not have discovered the cause yet, but you shouldn't have a severe anemia from Susacs. No, so it's I not, think I'm this, not saying that Susac was the cause of anemia. But don't you think it's more likely she has some undiscovered connective tissue disorder that is we associated had, we, with this our, process? Our first diagnosis was not Susac to begin with. We initially worked up in the direction of SLE or any. APLA syndrome or uh, we, uh, we were looking at any other systemic vasculitis actually. So we thoroughly investigated for all possible things. So, so you, you, I know you said that ANA wasn't positive, but you looked at double-stranded DNA, yes, yes, and TRO, yes. and Even HLA-B51 for Bechet's, everything we did. And uh, for uh, in all the infective workup, cardiac workup, everything came negative. What the point uh, to your um, like you mentioned about low hemoglobin, sir, I am, what I feel is that she was a case of um, probably a nutrition anemia, I can't be sure, but that was possibly ins added insult to the injury and could have converted a, could have co uh, contributed to a combined picture rather than a BRO because anemic retinopathy could have worsened the scenario. I'm yeah. not sure. I'm just, just another point, you know, which a little bit atypical, which you cause, which you call as gas, a gas flux. Yes, sir. So this hyperreprial, it's intraretinal aspect. It's it's on the it's, it's just not in the vascular. It's it's, it's vascular. along the course of the vessels, away from the site of obstruction is what is described. But this patient didn't have any particular site of obstruction. Whole of the retina was uh, right. not. So, so the thing is, uh, there's so much of atypicality. What Sunil is also trying to uh, you know uh, express. So are we looking at? Do you want to discount a possible of you know, crystalline retinopathy in this particular patient? Look at the right eye present. I would say, sir, but the acuteness of symptoms with encephalopathy, then hearing loss and mild bilateral retinal hemorrhage is crystalline retinopathy. I won't assume like, would uh, present that, uh, with the, such a. What do you think she was like? Yeah. I think this thought came with the. Yeah, can I, can I, can I make a point? Just a minute. So when, when we have to look at this case, he, he came across and said that this was hyperoxidosis patient in terms of. Exactly because of the web and uh, the vascular effects happen in the systemic involvement as, as well. So I'm just, just trying to expand the horizon. There's a design possibility of so many atypical branches to particular patients. Would that explain the encephalitis? Would that explain the encephalitis? That, I mean, would hyperoxidosis explain the encephalitis? No, no, sir. So the point is here what is the more most important feature to keep in mind it is the encephalitis what is the second important feature is the sensory neural uh, hearing loss and the third is the ocular thing now within the ocular there is now variation that you you don't need to have a combined this thing it's a vasculitis they could could be a uh, it could have been a crvo like picture it could have been this severe ischemia causing new vasculitis in fact i have a patient exactly like that like this but a male developed neovascularization in both the eyes and had to be extensively lasered and then the optic nerve still went. One eye is hand movements, other eye is 6-6. Fair enough. So, uh, the, the, <coughs> the diagnosis of Sudan? Yeah. There is no question. Where you it's a diagnosis of exclusion, sir. I agree. Like we have to, all possible things you can think of, you investigate, but they should fit the constellation of symptoms. Can't randomly think of anything unless it explains the patient's symptoms. I'm not sure whether Sudan is the diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, it has a very specific inclusion. It, it has, but like generally it has many differential DDs. Like even for the CNS point of view, it, it is most often multiple sclerosis is the closest DD. And from the systemic point of view, ocular and hearing, it's uh, autoimmune, uh, this vasculitis is which we need to rule out basically. But this particular uh, constellation of symptoms with this typical FFA finding of RTL wall hyperfluorescence and the clinical picture of those gas plugs. That is, that is. I, I'm, I'm not sure whether we can call them gas plaques. It's only in well, retrospect I'm that it, afraid, I also didn't know about it. I had to read up about it. Because hyperfluorescence typically it's not 
because it's usually at the bifurcation. No, sir. And that's that's the, the difference in. I'm talking about typical. In a typical, in a typical, uh, in a typical arterial occlusion, the the this uh, obstruction, the hyperfluorescence will be at the at the bifurcation. Okay. But in these cases, uh, in Suzak, it is described away from the site of the surgery, which is what we saw. That's for the plug anyway. So, plug. yeah. Uh, a female patient bilateral presentation, we should also rule out takayasus. Yes. Uh, and for takayasus, we have to look at the vasculature right from the subclave and up there, which we, did, we have not. We did carotid Doppler, cardiac workup. Uh, only only carotid therapy. Doppler can miss takayasus. And uh, ESR, CRP, so you would expect ESR and CRP to be raised. And uh, Because the arterial staining indicates ischemia of the arterial wall. Yes. Secondly, there is an abrupt cutoff, which is very well seen in a similar pathology of Takayasus. Many patients with Takayasus have pre-retinal loops of arteries, which we don't see here. Yes. So, in fact, the uh, good data is the triad only, incidentally. Google doctor. These three, these three is what makes your Google triad. So, this, so you start off, no, so what I'm saying is, yeah, unless you, yeah, unless you have, well, doc, Google's right here, yeah. <laughs> so the the basic point is, if you have something better to suggest, which which has the triad, then you consider the triad. It's good to be told. I don't know what what to be. And incidentally, better, incidentally, incidentally even even, even there, about you see, the a BRAO will not in the late stage. I mean, if it gets delayed, it may recanalize. You may not actually see that much signs. So the acute features that you're talking about of a BRAO may not be there. In fact, one of the things mentioned in the description is that the delay in diagnosis occurs because the triad is not complete most of the times. So here you have a triad which is complete and we are still looking for a differential, then at least we must have a differential which completes the triad. Like, as you said, SLE, yes, but if everything is ruled out, then SLE goes out of the window. In fact, no, when we referred the patient to the physician, their working diagnosis was APLA or SLE actually. Okay. I would, I would, so they, and they investigated for that even the anti cardiolipin antibodies, beta 2, lipoprotein, and IgG, IgM, which is very specific. They investigated it thoroughly and it all came out negative. So okay. it was never the diagnosis to begin with. It's only when we had nothing, that then we came up with Yeah. Okay. I would like to give a reverse message. If you have a patient with an encephalopathy and he presents to you with some eye problems, then kindly look in terms of Suzak also, because that's a diagnosis which otherwise will not be looked at. <laughs> and we will miss it in many cases. So I'm just trying to put it the other way. Oh. My, my opinion about that, I don't think this is Suzak's. I don't know what it is. It may be its own N of one entity. Because uh, the first case of SUSAC was the first case of SUSAC described. Uh, and so I understand that it doesn't fit into anything, but I don't think this fits into SUSAC because of the severity of this uh, presentation and some of these other things. I know they were explaining maybe there's nutritional anemia. It just seems like it's a bridge too far for me. Uh, can I just ask? Yes, sir. In women, a little bit of six. That's huh? pretty low. Yeah, in women, it's not such a big sign. Uh, what, Nine, you would consider as normal, actually. Was, was that no platelets? So were the platelets low by any chance? No, no, platelets were fine. Six point six hemoglobin. So we actually almost, if you randomly check few of our patients, they will have. Actually. That's. So you wouldn't be thinking of uh, malaria or uh, dengue or anything. Not no, no. causing anemia and blockage. <laughs> But what I feel is that its anemia could have also contributed to the worsened uh, picture of the vascular involvement. And I can only be conjecturing here. I okay. So, yes. I think all of you should take a break and go have oranges. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. That was a good discussion. And uh, thank you for attending this session. So, I'll ask all the panel members to stay back for the photograph. Members and presenters.